Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to Let's Intercept OpenGL function calls for logging. Uh, my name's uh, Mike Shaw. I'll be with you all for the next 30 minutes here. Uh, in this talk, it's, I think if you've never done any instrumentation at all uh, and sort of uh, haven't explored this area, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, if you've done a little bit of uh, instrumentation or sort of at an intermediate level, uh, I hope you'll learn a you know, cool trick or two uh, in the domain of OpenGL. Okay, so here's the abstract. You guys saw that. Uh, just who am I? Right now, I'm an assistant teaching professor at Northeastern University. I teach courses in computer graphics, uh, computer systems. That's sort of my area. Uh, Research-wise, I'm interested in static dynamic analysis. So come talk to me about that in software visualization. Uh, me as a person, I'm a, a teacher, runner, weightlifter, rock climber uh, when I'm not doing computer science things. Okay, so some terminology. You can check this out later when the slides are available. In uh, live demo time, you know, right from the start, what could go wrong, of course? Um, so I want to just show you what I've sort of built, what you'll learn about, uh, just to get an idea of, you know, what to pay attention to in this talk. Um, so I'm going to show a little uh, graphics program. Um, nothing uh, crazy, um, but it's just a little uh, world here we can sort of traverse. This is an OpenGL scene. Uh, I'm sort of crawling around the world here. Uh, and as I'm doing this, uh, in the background in my terminal, there is a bunch of text being logged here. Okay, So those are all the OpenGL calls that are being made. Okay, And it'll flicker occasionally um, as it sort of updates. Okay, so that's the kind of tool we want to build today, something that's logging a bunch of uh, information about what's going on in our graphics application. All right, so that's where um, we're heading. So live demo worked on the first try, always a good sign. Okay. So our goals for today are to walk through some strategies for building uh, what I'm calling the OpenGL logger, um, you know, thinking about how uh, you might log function calls for OpenGL or maybe a particular domain uh, you're interested or working in. Okay, so my only expectation is maybe you're familiar with OpenGL, you've heard about it, uh, or will at least leave excited to learn about it uh, after today. Uh, and for tomorrow, uh, definitely do start you know, extending what you've learned uh, for your own domain, research additional uh, instrumentation strategies, and then come talk to me and we'll figure out how to you know, build the best tool possible. Okay, slides and code will be available uh, after the talk at this URL, uh, sometime after the conference. And let's begin with uh, the OpenGL part. So, you know, what is OpenGL? Um, just straight from their website, it's the industry foundation for high performance graphics you know, for games, virtual reality, uh, mobile phones, et cetera. Uh, and it's typically been implemented as a C uh, API programming uh, library, okay? Uh, in thinking about OpenGL and you know, why is it uh, important to debug uh, or maybe hard to debug uh, as far as software goes, well, you know, point number one is correctness um, of a visual artifact is sort of subjective, right? What looks good uh, versus you know, what's right or wrong, okay? So even if you look in the you know, bottom left, there are some bugs there. You know, should they be there or not? Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. Uh, and in especially very interactive environments, it's hard to you know, recreate um, you know, what caused some visual defect. Okay, so that's where a logger or you know, recording some information can be really helpful. And I think this problem is becoming more and more important, okay? Because we want to log and sort of correct for defects, but we might also want to log for performance. Okay, so uh, typically a video game, you know, some real-time applications trying to run at 30 or 60 frames per second. Okay, so movies 24 frames per second typically. Uh, games are even faster than that. And now that we have these sort of virtual reality environments, we need to run 90 frames per second so folks don't get sick and so on. Okay, so performance is going to be really important. Okay. So why a logger and how does it sort of fit nicely with OpenGL? Well, OpenGL itself goes through several stages of um, what's known as the graphics pipeline. Okay, so I've highlighted just a few um, of sort of, you know, you have a graphical scene, it's sort of with a camera, then there's lighting, then you project it into a 2D space, get rid of some stuff you don't see, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so all you need to know is that OpenGL follows this pipeline. Uh, and it's even 
Uh, now in modern OpenGL, it's a programmable pipeline. Okay, so you're sort of customizing what it looks like. And this again means you might need some custom tools to monitor what's going on. Okay, so we know a little bit about OpenGL. And now the question is, how do we create our first logger for some OpenGL applications? Right, just starting out with you know, simple scenes like this. And I wanna walk through sort of my evolution of when I'm uh, building these sort of tools, okay? So it's some different strategies for a dynamic analysis, okay? Um, you know, sort of apply as needed and you sort of use uh, the right tool for the right job. Okay, and you know, this sort of starts with a little bit of fascination of looking at some of the uh, profiling tools available from companies like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, et cetera. Um, NVIDIA has uh, NVIDIA's Insights, where they have these cool you know, pixel history tools where you can see exactly why is a pixel a pixel and sort of trace uh, that way. Uh, Intel, the same, and RenderDoc. And these are sort of some of the state-of-the-art uh, tools you might look at for uh, related work. So let's sort of you know, figure out step one of these lovely tools, just sort of logging information. Okay, so first if I'm building a tool that collects information, I need to commit to some strategy, okay? And there's really two strategies I can think of when I'm collecting information about a program. Uh, the first is sort of a sampling strategy when I'm uh, collecting information, okay? So tools you might be familiar with like Perf, uh, profilers uh, sample the program counter periodically in the stack. Uh, and depending on how many times you land in uh, some address space, well, that's how many times you know, some function's been called. Okay? And the more often you sample, well, the more accurate your profile is going to be. So the trade-off there, though, is that you know, if we sample more, sample a lot, we're going to slow our programs down. Okay? Um, but if we don't sample everything, then we're gonna miss out on some information. Uh, if we need information to rebuild some sort of call hierarchy, uh, which is displayed on the right here, um, you know, that might be harder to do, right, if we're just missing samples, missing information. Okay, so our second uh, strategy is the logger, where we could think of the sampler that samples 100% of the time. Uh, and that generates you know, some sort of profile or trace of every function that's called, okay? Um, we can sort of tweak again the granularity of how often this is. In our case, just open GL calls, but in the future you might want to just collect information about everything um, and see if you can get away with that. Okay, so I'm going to commit us to a strategy, uh, and that's to the logging of 100% of information, okay? Or at least 100% of open GL information, because uh, that's going to help us debug. We don't want to lose something, right, because we're drawing pictures. Um, and losing a, a key piece of information um, might mislead us. Okay, so of course the cost of full instrumentation is that um, you know, we're modifying the original program, and this means it's not gonna run as fast uh, as our other ones, okay, as the original source without instrumentation. Okay, you know, in the worst case it makes our you know, graphical program sort of I.O. bound, right, if we're logging lots of information sort of as the program's running. Uh, and that can really slow us down. Uh, very likely when you're performing instrumentation, you're gonna disrupt your data access patterns. Okay, so if you are optimizing for things like uh, minimizing your uh, cache misses, well, we're just adding a bunch of stuff and they're still gonna mess that up. Um, but, you know, that's okay. Um, so, you know, there's simply just more work to do um, when we're instrumenting uh, our programs. Okay, so our first try uh, of many uh, here, um, is, you know, the old trusty just logging with printf, okay? The source is available, you know, just insert some printfs in there, um, and that'll do the trick, right? We'll be able to see uh, in this example that GLClear was called, and uh, we proceed forward. Uh, now, of course, you know, I see some snickers here. This is quite tedious to do manually, um, but that's okay. And of course, for this audience, I mean uh, C out, not printf. We're at CPPCon. <laughs> um, but choose your favorite, um, and we can improve it, you know, just a little bit, okay? So again, just sort of our lightweight uh, logging of information here. 
uh, and make things a little cleaner with a macro, right? And sort of utilizing the preprocessor. So I've got this sort of, you know, define some log OpenGL uh, macro here, and we'll just print what was called, and then you know, actually do the thing. Um, again, a little bit better, right? And we can keep improving this incrementally, right? We can give programmers or developers, um, you know, sort of a conditional compilation here. You know, so they can turn logging on by you know, flipping a bit. Um, so not too bad, right? Lightweight if you're doing a quick debug might be the right approach for you know, the sort of small scene that I showed here. Uh, but you know, as you know, people are smiling, uh, the problem still remains that we're modifying a lot of source code. The source transformation could be error prone. It's time consuming. Um, so we want to do a little bit better here. So moving on to sort of a second attempt. So the second try, let's reset for a moment. So attempt two is, you know, can I get, at least get rid of that sort of tedious, you know, error prone process of where I might forget to, you know, wrap some function um, with my macro. Uh, and we have tools for this, okay? Many might be familiar with sort of various C or C++ frameworks. Um, LLVM is the one that comes to mind because that's what I have experience in. Um, but it is a tool where I can take some source code, transform it, and uh, get a new output and, and sort of compile that. Um, so now our goal is, in the LLVM world, is you know, to write a function level pass. Okay? And what that means is if I have a bunch of OpenGL functions, uh, as I find them, you know, just instrument those uh, functions, sort of one at a time. Okay, sort of thinking about your compilers, um, going one uh, function at uh, a time. Uh, but there is this little problem here. Uh, you know, what are all the OpenGL functions? How do I keep track of them? Um, you know, if you're working in a different domain, how would you find out what every function is that you need to instrument? Okay, that has to do something with uh, graphics or sound or whatever domain you're working in. Um, so let's back up for a second and do a little bit of information gathering. Um, so one strategy might be to look at you know, the documentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, for OpenGL, docs.gl, I can sort of scrape through this, pick up function names, um, and that's, that's not a terrible approach, might get us um, you know, some way forward. Uh, another approach for OpenGL, however, is you know, we can look at some of the header files, okay, where these functions are defined. OpenGL has um, you know, sort of these third-party uh, files, one's called glad, glad.h, uh, and glue, which contain you know, a list of all of the OpenGL functions for us. Okay, if you actually look in those files, it's just a giant uh, list of pound defines for some um, function pointers, okay, to make them a little easier for us to use as users. And you know, parsing that uh, file actually isn't too bad. Okay? Um, so here's a, a sample of what I'm finding in glad.h, and you'll see these sort of pound defines, you know, clear color, uh, the function. Um, so I could fit it in a slide. And I don't want you to read the code. I think most folks are familiar with sort of parsing on the left side of C++. Uh, but on the right side, if I do go through this process, I get all of the OpenGL functions here, which is kind of neat. Now I can use that as sort of uh, to feed into these tools and, and automate something. OK, so the key insight then, uh, if you're in the LLVM world or compilers world with uh, GCC or whichever tool, is that you can then create a little function hook. Um, you know, in LLVM, we think about this in sort of the uh, bit code level, where I have this setup hook function, and it's going to insert this um, you know, sort of empty or stub function that I can connect into every uh, function entry, okay? every OpenGL function that I enter into. Um, and that's you know, at least one strategy, again, doing this at the source level. Um, if you're interested in this part, I've done another 80 minute talk on that. So we can't, we only have 30 minutes together, <laughs> but the link is there um, for how exactly, you know, setup hooks is set up. Okay, so again, LLVM, create an instrumentation function, merge that function into your previous code base, and then uh, insert it into uh, every OpenGL function entry, right? So, you know, the first basic block do some blogging of information. Okay. 
Uh, now, a little aside, uh, you might say, well, is LLVM, is that a little bit too heavyweight for this? Um, you know, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, but you have some other options still. Um, if you haven't explored, you know, your compilers, uh, they often give you some freedom for this task. So here in sort of a slide is an example of a compile time interpositioning. Um, and the example I have here is sort of replacing malloc with my own. Um, and if you sort of, you know, parse through the, uh, the GCC line, I'm just replacing malloc with my malloc. Okay, and I could do this for every OpenGL function if I want. Okay, so this is another option we could explore here. Okay, so we've got all these functions. We're generating data in you know, one of two ways, whether it's with printf, but how do we sort of store it? And, and here's the crux of the problem with logging. You know, we're logging lots of data per frame. Right? We talk 30, 60, 90 frames per second, many, many function calls. And right now, you know, I'm just in the demo I showed printing to standard out. Okay, does the job fine enough. Uh, but this is going to slow us down quite a bit. Um, so we need, you know, some more strategies, some, some mitigation here. And my first storage strategy is just to, you know, minimize the amount of bytes that we're writing. Okay, so the type of data that I'm storing is essentially function names. That's what I'm logging. So if I'm storing a bunch of strings uh, for each function, you know, that can grow quite large. Um, so, you know, let's push that a step further and do something a little bit better. And we'll create a hash map and map each function name to an integer. Okay, each function name's uh, unique. OpenGL is a C API, remember, so we can do this. Um, and that way we'll just sort of write the integer out uh, instead of the full string. Okay, so a little bit better there. Uh, and then we can reconstruct our data, look at our logs after the program is run. Just sort of do that reverse mapping. Okay, so as an example, here's some OpenGL functions. Here's one that's called GL clear color. I'll look up its value in a map, its integer value. You know, C++ unordered map will do the trick here. It's fast. And I'll store the integer value in some other data structure. Okay, and we'll figure out what that is. Okay, in the future, you know, you'll want to think about too, how do I store, you know, the function arguments um, as well, because those will have insight. Just keeping it simple now. Okay, so our second sort of data storage strategy here. You know, if we're sort of writing out a lot of data um, to some expanding data structure, um, you know, when those fill up, those will have some sort of amortized cost when they need to copy and expand again. Okay, and that might create a software hang that might be disruptive in an interactive uh, graphics application. Um, so a strategy to try to get around with that um, and that I've chosen is to instead, you know, allocate a bunch of big uh, buffers. In fact, uh, ring buffers here, okay? So we just write a bunch of data to one of our ring buffers. Uh, it's gonna be done in a separate thread, and when it's filled up, we use another one, okay? Um, and if we can get away with this, um, you know, just filling these up, if we can allocate enough space, uh, then we don't have to write until the program's actually terminated. Um, but if we have to write during program termination, it's, or while uh, execution, it's still not too bad. Okay, so let me sort of highlight what's going on. So here's where we're storing data. You can see the arrows sort of moving around here. Data is being stored, lots of OpenGL functions being called. And then we're filled up, okay? So then we gotta move to another buffer where we start storing new data. And then this one can start writing to disk or recording wherever we need to, okay? So that's the idea there behind the data storage. And again, we're just storing those integers. Okay. So we're at the halfway point or past the halfway point, and um, you know, we figured out a few things. So far, you know, we have the ability to find our OpenGL functions, what we're interested in logging. We can do this sort of source to source code transformation whether that's you know, manually and painfully, uh, or using a tool like LLVM to help us out. Uh, and we have at least two data storage uh, strategies to help us be more efficient. 
uh, at least to start, and then you know optimize as needed. Okay, so the big question is then, you know, what if I don't have the source code, but I still want to know what's going on, right? If I'm an artist sort of working on the team and want to investigate uh, and not dig into the code, um, what do I do? Okay, so we need some other strategies. And these ones fall under uh, dynamic binary instrumentation. Okay. All right, so binary instrumentation defined, if you haven't uh, played around with it, it's the act of modifying some binary, again, without access to the source code. Um, and since this is happening during a program runtime, we're doing this dynamically. Okay, we're injecting some code, uh, as this illustration is showing, uh, from the left into the right to make it bigger and have our logging functions. Okay, so attempt one, sort of walking through this. Um, this is obviously an important problem and a lot of smart folks have thought about it. Uh, Pin tools by Intel is perhaps one of the most uh, popular frameworks. So it's gonna work with x86, x86-64, a few other uh, you know, instruction sets, um, and how it's working is it's essentially JIT compiling uh, your x86 code that's uh, executing. Okay, and while that's happening, while this sort of JIT process is going on, we can inject our own code as needed, even dynamically. Um, so again, we can reuse some of our infrastructure we've been building up from our previous slides, right? Collecting function names from uh, what we did in the LLVM pass. Um, but now we can do the modifications in real time. Okay, so very uh, sort of roughly speaking, uh, on the right I have an illustration of sort of what my main program looks like of a pin tool. Um, just sort of getting the symbols, uh, initiating the pin tools, and there's a cool uh, add instrumentation function, uh, and then we start our program like normal, okay? Um, and again, you know, a lot of these tools are starting to look the same, that there's another function here for adding instrumentation. Okay, and that's sort of this uh, image load, and then I'm adding uh, instrumentation here. Okay, uh, and one of the things with pin, one of the sort of tricks with it is we need to make sure we're, you know, instrumenting, again, only our OpenGL functions. Um, so we have to do some sort of tuning here. Um, and I've had okay performance with this tool. Um, I think it's a great tool, and I think it's probably the most portable option if you're working on Linux, Mac, Windows, you know, multiple platforms. Again, it's supported by many folks. Um, so you'll have instrumentation routines in PIN. Uh, that, that's for you know, instrumentation that only happens once in the binary. Uh, if you need more control, there's analysis routines um, that happen as needed. So if you're updating some counter over and over again, um, you sort of have some different options of how you're collecting information. Okay, so again, uh, as we're performing instrumentation, we need you know, symbol names, the symbol names of our functions. Uh, for our source transformations, it was very clear. We wanted the actual functions that are sort of meant for users, GL clear color, you know, stuff like that. Um, but this time, we, since we're in the, in the binary, uh, we need to know how they're stored, okay? And objdump is always my tool to the rescue when I'm trying to do some sort of you know, reverse engineering task. Okay? So if you haven't played with objdump, here's what it looks like. So objdump with dash t, lab is the name of our binary, and then I'm sort of just grepping around for um, OpenGL things that I know of, like GL clear color. Okay, so that's searching the symbol table and giving me a symbol name. In this case, it's coming from the uh, glad underscore uh, you know, library. And if you don't like uh, objdump for whatever reason, there's uh, readelf, uh, another great tool uh, on Linux as well. Uh, this is another example of dumping out the symbol table, okay, and then doing that same exercise of sort of parsing through your binary. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So, you know, we're rounding out at attempt two, uh, and I started, you know, exploring around things and found ptrace. And this is sort of the, the final attempt. Uh, you know, it's a lightweight tool, um, so it's gonna be fast for logging, or I've had fast experience with it. And ptrace has typically been used to implement uh, a lot of 
debuggers, right? So sort of thinking about it from that angle, maybe we can pause or halt our loggers if there's bad behavior observed, okay? So ptrace, if, again, if you haven't used it, it's a system call uh, in the Linux operating system, uh, and it allows us to sort of attach to processes that are running and then sort of log on demand. And then we can detach if needed. Okay, so reminder on syscalls, right? We make the call in our user code, jump into the kernel, have access to things uh, in the kernel uh, area, and then we jump back into the user. Okay, so just a little anatomy on uh, ptrace, the sort of a skeleton of the code, um, right? So uh, from uh, our tool, our logger that we're building, uh, we're gonna fork into a new process uh, and then trace it. So you'll see about halfway through the slides, there's a ptrace call and trace me command, okay? And then we execute our executable. Once we've done that, uh, then we can utilize uh, ptrace to actually start peeking and poking around the data, okay? So these are our ways to inject uh, new code, look at symbols to see you know, what function has executed. Okay, so this is where I'm actually uh, doing some of the work. Okay, so wrapping up, as we've got about three minutes and a bunch of strategies we've discussed. You know, there's yet more tricks uh, and things we can try with sort of instrumentation here. Uh, Ftrace, I think, is a lesser known tool um, that's also more specific to Linux. Uh, and there's the load preload trick, okay? so. This probably works fine, again, for 90% of our needs to get us started, right? Just load in a shared library, sort of override with your uh, function name uh, and repeat, okay? Um, other useful tools, especially with load preload, are LDD, and that'll show you, you know, which shared libraries are being loaded with your executable. That way you might figure out a way to hook in, you know, picking some function you know there. Okay. And if you remember, 28 minutes ago, I said I was a teacher at the start. So you guys have some challenges, some homework, some things I think are feasible next steps, right? So the code for the stuff I presented, that'll be online, but things you should add. You know, timers to your logging functions, get some information. Maybe timers to then think about capturing per frame what's going on. Maybe writing your logs out to some database, right, so you can investigate it. Uh, in the middle there, you know, we're talking about graphics, but I've sort of skipped Vulkan, Metal, DirectX. Those might be interesting to look at too. Uh, and you know, finally, sort of in the more difficult areas, you know, if I have all this information, can I recreate a snapshot uh, of the scene, right? And that's what these, you know, NVIDIA pixel history tools are really good at. Uh, and then sort of wild at the end, I don't know, I was just thinking of stuff, but implement your own system call that looks for, you know, OpenGL things might be more performant. Okay, so some resources specific to OpenGL. These will be available as needed. Some resources specific to profiling and just, you know, getting read up on some of this stuff and some of the different tricks. Um, and the finale sort of, you know, did we even solve anything here? <laughs> you know, OpenGL specific. Uh, I know while I was going through this exercise, these were the things I found by just simply logging and printing out what was going on. You know, I was redundantly calling things like GL, enable, and disable over and over and over again per frame. Didn't need to do that if there wasn't a change in state. Uh, I was able to start counting things like how many calls are there to GL, draw, raise, or draw elements. Those are the things that sort of draw the final uh, models out, okay? Um, so those were, you know, a few things I learned. I hope you implement some of the homeworks there. And I hope we can continue this uh, next year in a longer session from where we left off. Uh, so thank you, CPPCon 2018, for having me. Uh, we've got 30 seconds, or I'll take questions uh, outside here. Thank you very much.